it's one o'clock on Tuesday, April 12th. So you must be watching Science at SOST. SOST is the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And every week we bring in an exciting student's project to try and get some idea of the active research which is being done here at the Manoa campus. And today I'm really pleased to introduce Kei Takazawa, who is a graduate student in earth science. So welcome, Kay. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, I wonder if we can start with you just saying a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're a grad student, but uh, we're talking about infrasound today. So why are we interested in sound? Hey, thanks for the introduction, Pete. Uh, yes, so sound, yeah, we use, or we actually we use it as our senses quite often. We hear it all over the place, but there's a lot of uh, unique applications we can use uh, with sound by like monitoring. And so I'm mainly on task to look at sound that's in the wild and try to figure out, you know, what kind of signatures we can pick up, maybe relating to rockets or explosions or so, anything. So else. what's your background? How does a graduate student or someone doing their bachelor's degree become interested in sound? You know, are you a physicist? Are you an engineer, a psychologist, or, or what's your background? Yeah, uh, so my undergraduate, uh, I did, I started as a physics major. I was you know, interested in the physical science and generally, uh, and I was, I think, sophomore year, uh, towards the middle of it, I realized that I wanted to do more real-life applications. Uh, and then so I added another major, uh, applied math. So I was using physics and math to do some uh, projects. Uh, I think I did some hurricane tracking uh, in my undergraduate years. And then um, I was also uh, working as an audio engineer um, for my campus. So I was... Uh, a stage person for a little bit, um, doing gaffing and so on. Then I worked my way up to doing cameras. And then uh, at the end, I was at the soundboard mixing uh, for concerts and so on. Okay. And then, um, where, where did you do your undergraduate degree? Uh, that was in uh, Wheaton College. Uh, it's in Illinois, not the Boston one. Okay. Too, so. oh, all right. Yeah. Fascinating. So with that yeah. background, you know, if you were a, a, a sound manager at a, a nightclub or you were doing other productions, um, it's probably a, a labor of love for you, isn't it? That uh, sound has both the, the pleasure as well as the research side. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's great. Um, when I first applied to uh, University of Hawaii, uh, Milton asked me like you might be interested in what i'm doing you know i look at sound just you know kind of like you but more on the lower frequencies and we use it to detect a bunch of natural signatures right right and and that's milton gar says your your thesis advice okay well sound is uh something everybody has heard of no pun intended but um maybe we can go to the first slide so you can explain a little bit more about uh your kind of your kind of research sure Yes, so I guess uh, it's probably good to kind of start with uh, what is sound itself. Um, yeah. But yeah, so sound is pretty much just vibrations in the air. Um, well, it doesn't just have to be air, but in some kind of medium. Uh, I have an example here with a speaker. I think most people are familiar um, what a speaker is. Maybe they're not quite sure how it works. Um, so you see those little discs on there. Those things vibrate. And then that vibration then moves the air particles around and then that different pressures uh, reaches our eardrum and then that eardrum shakes and then it goes into uh, our inner ear uh, this little snail looking like structure uh, that's the cochlea but that kind of works as an inverse piano or more like maybe a xylophone would make more sense and so you have the different lengths and different uh, strings that correspond to different frequencies that get moved and then that information goes to our brains and tells us what frequencies um, those sounds are. Okay, and, and the diagram which we're looking at there um, presumably is just one frequency because the refraction waves look as if they're all evenly spaced. Yes. But your kind of research involves much more complex, um, so literally a spectrum of sound waves. So maybe the second slide will help us better understand what it is we hear or even don't hear, right? Yes. So what I said, um, frequency, 
as it shows on the very bottom here, it just means like how many times that wave's compression and refractions happen um, per second. So when we had the very left, the, those long periods, when we see at one hertz, that means there's a contraction and then a, well, yeah, smaller and then larger, oh, one second. And then at the higher frequencies um, that, you know, for like a hundred uh, where our more vowel sounds are around or maybe 150 hertz, um, that means there's 150 basically oscillations or uh, backs and forths that are happening um, every second. So we uh -huh. generally hear in like the 20 to maybe 20 K Hertz. Um, if you've ever seen the backside of uh, earphones, a lot of times it will write a frequency range on it. And that's what you would see like 20 to 20 K Hertz. Um, and that's what, you know, what we speak in, but you might've heard of like ultrasonic, um, which yeah. maybe like bats, you know, using ultrasound to hear, and they make really high frequency noise, get that, you know, echo back to them and then try to figure out uh, what's around them or maybe medical ultrasound, which is uh, even higher that's, you know, used to look what's inside, you know. Uh, I suspect people yeah. are, um, are familiar with the fact that, you know, bats can hear uh, at frequencies that we cannot. And I see from the slide that whales can hear um, a little bit lower frequency than humans do. Yeah. Um, so what is infrasound? What, what wavelengths would you describe as infrasound? So generally, uh, infrasound will be 20 hertz and below. So it's like the opposite of the ultrasound. It's not too high that we can't hear. It's that it's too low frequencies that we can't hear. Um, and we say 20 hertz, but in reality, we can hear um some infrasound probably even in the 16 hertz range if we crank up the volume extremely um it's just that our ears aren't tuned to it so generally we speak of infrasound as less than 20 hertz so less than 20 oscillations per second and that's that's an in infrasound range and and at those frequencies that's where your research interests lie so yes uh, so, am i correct in thinking that all of the applications which we're going to hear about for the rest of the show happens at frequencies less than roughly 20 hertz. Uh, yes, and that is where the main, I guess, energy of the signal is. Um, yeah. There are still higher frequency information, uh, even in like the explosion sounds or, um, you know, uh, one of the greater natural uh, sources of infrasound that uh, we've all are familiar with is like, uh, ocean waves and but well, we can hear them as well however the more energy the, the larger louder sound that we can't hear is actually in the infrasound range and most of our signals that we look at are uh, most of their energy or the loudness is actually in the infrasound okay and, and it, it's a complete mixture of different frequencies you know i don't think anything in real life is just a single frequency yep. unless it's been you know, uh, human produced. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we're talking about infrasound today. Okay. So let's take a look and you can explain to us some of the uh, environments in which infrasound might be produced that you can do scientific research on. So let's, let's go to the third slide. I think that will describe. All right. So nice diagram. What are we looking at? Here are some uh, yeah, sources of infrasound that we might be interested in or familiar with. Um, so one of the, like my advisor, uh, Milton's uh, original research uh, was looking at volcanoes. So he used infrasound uh, from volcano eruptions um, and also just the based sound of volcanoes to try to determine what are their activity levels at and so on. So that's mm -hmm. one way of uh, using uh, infrasound. Uh, another is earthquakes. Uh, most people use seismometers, which is uh, measures like the sh ground motions of uh, co ground motions caused by earthquakes. Um, however, uh, like earthquakes or ground motions, uh, sound waves are compression waves. Well, not all ground motions are compression waves, but uh, sound waves are compression waves, um, which means that earthquakes also produce infrasound. So we can use uh, infrasound as a secondary detector for uh, earthquakes, uh, large rockets, uh, airplanes also cause them. So we might uh, use multiple phones to try to track where rockets are flying or where they're headed towards. Uh, we can also use it to detect 
uh, meteorites entering in uh, the atmosphere. Uh, when it you know, kind of gets into Earth, it creates a large boom sound, which can travel very far. Um, and then explosions, storms, um, all these types of things. One of the benefits of infrasound that uh, I forgot to mention is that it travels very far distances. Um, so kind of similar to how our sunsets are more red because the red lights have a lower wavelength or a lower, uh, or I say larger wavelength and lower frequency, uh, sound waves don't get absorbed as much as uh, it's lower in sound. So then it travels through walls, it travels through long distances, and that helps uh, find uh, and use multiple uh, arrays of microphones to figure out where uh, these infrasound sources are from. Now, would it be correct to sort of say that these different sources of infrasound, um, what we, we saw meteors and rockets and, and volcanic eruptions. Can we think of it as like a, a fingerprint? How would you perhaps distinguish between a meteor and a piece of space debris coming into the atmosphere? Can you tell that they are different phenomena? Yes. So. In a sense, oh, these large infrasound, or especially for sparse, so for something that's just entering and not a continuous sound, but like a brief moment in mm -hmm. sound, a lot of the infrasound generated corresponds to how much energy it was carrying. Uh -huh. And so for the maybe smaller space debris compared to a maybe larger meteorite, we could probably start seeing a difference in what might be the mass yeah. of the entry or was there more burning or was there more of a disruption in the atmosphere? Yeah, I know your advisor Milton worked on the breakup of the space shuttle Columbia, for example, that it, it is clearly quite a large piece of debris um, and volcanic eruptions at Kilauea. Those signatures are very different. Yes, yeah, I'd say they're, they're quite um, different. Um, also the propagation. So we can we could also tell from which direction things are coming in. So for like space theory, it would be from you know above the sky, whereas volcanoes right. would be from the ground. So we could uh by having multiple microphones around the world, we can see uh where it's coming from and what's likely the source. So it would be similar to like uh a seismologist would have different seismometers around the surface of the globe, and you can triangulate to where. Uh, the source of the sound is coming? Yeah, exactly. We will do the exact same thing. It's just uh, okay. instead of the earth, we use the atmosphere. <laughs> right, right, right. right. And, and, and you've got some great examples I'm really keen to let the viewers take a look at. So let's move on to slide four. And you know, this is quite a, a timely uh, example. Uh, so yep. we're looking here um, at a volcanic eruption, okay? Yep. Um, uh, just talk us through uh some of the slide here yes so this was uh earlier this year we we had the uh, hanga tonga eruption um and so that was a uh, you might have you know heard it in the news i, I assume so <laughs> it was one of the largest uh, eruptions that uh, have happened in the yeah it's probably uh you know 100 year event um right. yeah it was and yeah. are we looking we're looking at the uh, the top of the eruption plume in the left-hand yes. image. Yes. Okay. So, so this was taken from the space station or uh, a satellite, right? So, and that that's pretty big. I understand yeah. it went up about forty kilometers or like thirty-five yeah. miles. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And then, and then the diagram on the right-hand side. What's that? Uh, What's that yeah. showing? So that is uh, pressure data uh, from one of the uh, stations, well, one of the uh, infrasound station or maybe barometer stations more accurate. Um, so sound, like I said, with the vibration and there's these different pressures. Uh, if we're looking at more long-term changes rather than the short-term, well, we could look at these barometers that uh, you might've heard of. Um, you see these different pressures like overall but for a large explosions these uh periods or the main frequency of the wave is so low that you'd see the major changes in the even just in a barometer um and so what we see here is uh three peaks um from the first arrival from the 
So first, I guess, you know, first is, you know, sphere. And so we have an explosion happening at one location. And then from there, uh, sound travels, you know, like a sphere outwards. So then it travels both ways. Um, so we have the, the closest path from the eruption to this signal uh, that you see the first spike there. And then we have the farther path coming around from the other side, then uh, causing another speak. And then that first signal went around the earth one more time and then got back to the signal. So we are seeing the sound wave for this uh, pressure, major pressure differential going around the earth uh, multiple times. Uh, which that, is, that's uh, incredible. And, and um, those pressure data, uh, were they recorded in Hawaii or um, oh, yes. they, they, they were? So as yeah. part of your part of your group, in other words. And that's quite remarkable. You said earlier that these low frequency sound waves can travel great distances, but going around the entire planet three times is, is quite impressive. So how do you know how long that would, would take? How long for sound to go one way around the, the planet? I think it was the. Uh, I think the last slides showed it too. It was the thirty-five uh, hours for it to travel once okay. around. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that that that's still quite remarkable that a, a single eruption. Um, let's move on to to slide five then, which I think is a uh, a, a smaller scale um, acoustic event. Yes. And uh, again, we've got two slides. So tell us what the left hand slide is showing. So this was uh, the 2013 uh, Russian meteor, which um, might be in the back of people's memories by now, but uh, at the time when people were uh, still excited about the end of the world in 2012, <laughs> or in the, you know, it didn't come happen, but in 2013, there was a Russian meteor and they're like, oh, maybe it's the next year. But um, so it's just a picture of, a, I think it was a truck driver that captured the uh, meteorite entering uh, to the Earth's atmosphere. And then to the right, we see on top a more time series of the the waveform, you know, having like a large spike and going on. And, so and, on. And what, yep. what are the colors? What What's purple, what's red, and what's... Yes. So below yeah. is something called like a spectrogram, which shows not just the time progression, but then the frequency content of the waveform. And then these colors show the signal to noise ratio or uh, just the loudness compared to the ambient pressure. So the yellow means much uh, louder and then the purple's less and then black right. meaning. That, that, that looks pressure. like the uh, voice recognition display on some of these uh, TV detective series, right? Trying to identify, yes. it, it, is it the same principle, but lower frequency? Yes, that's exactly. Uh, we can extend this uh, as long as there is the frequency rate of the um, captured microphone is high enough. We can go all the way up to a human vocal uh, recognition range. <laughs> okay, so the, the technology would be having a microphone that <laughs> operates at a fast enough repetition rate to record some of this information. Yeah. For infrasound, um, because the frequencies are so uh, low, we can actually get away with uh, recording at very low frequencies. Uh, for example, uh, the Nyquist frequency, or what you can capture with the microphone sample rate is about No one knows yeah. what Nyquist frequency is. <laughs> Come on, let, let's yeah. back up, help the viewers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to explain onto it, but uh, <laughs> we're, if we're capturing... Uh, a sound at 100 hertz. So the microphone is trying to record, um, you know, making note of what pressure is every 100 times every second. We can recreate signals up to uh, half, so about 50 hertz. Okay. And so that uh, 50 hertz would be the Nyquist, which is just the half of the capture rate of the microphone sensor. In your former career as a this jockey, would you? get involved with the technology needed to make some of those measurements? Or are you doing that as part of your graduate work now? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I guess yes to both. So a lot of the things that um, I did was uh, like mastering tracks. So you'd record uh, as flat as possible, hopefully, um, some kind of instrument or some music. Right. And then now you want to balance that so it sounds nicer. So there's certain frequencies that might not sound well or, it, there's so certain frequency that was a little bit low to capture so you want to increase that frequency so 
a lot of sound boards that you, you might have seen with all the knobs or, you know, you see DJs like touching stuff. Um, those, uh, you know, control different uh, frequency bands and how loud those frequencies are. So similarly, I guess with my research currently, uh, we look at all these different uh, infrasound signatures and then try to extract the most useful parts for our research. Right. And again, it's kind of like you've got a fingerprint for each type of sound source, right? So yes. do, do, do you have a library of what, say, a media sounds like or what a volcanic eruption sounds like, or is it more detailed, a it's, unique one-off? It's both, I would say. Um, there are like the theoretical or like the ideal, like if there was no disruption, we're in like a nice controlled environment, and then there was a meteorite dropped in there, yeah. we'll see a clear, meteorite signal. Similarly with explosions, if it's in a nice environment, we'll see this ideal shape of a uh, explosion signature. However, um, you might know that the atmosphere is a lot of times messy. It might be you know, windy, it might be raining, uh, there's um, different pressures and so on, and that jumbles up the signal quite a bit. And so what we end up with is like a core uh, signature. Um, and if it's quiet enough, uh, we could figure out that that's what it is, but sometimes if it's too loud. Yeah. We now you mentioned the explosion, so let's move on to slide six, and I guess um, one of the areas of research, at least your advisor, Milton Garces, is involved in, um, is a really useful <laughs> application of infrasound, right? Um, yes. We've got a global map here. Um, tell us a bit about what that map is showing. Sure. So. Um, there's something called a uh, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Um, it's just an agreement uh, with a lot of countries said that, okay, let's stop uh, nuclear testing, at least on, uh, on surface levels. <laughs> um, and so that we could limit the uh, environmental impact and also so that we won't cause a terrible war with nuclear weapons. Um, and so part of the agreement is to make sure that no countries are uh, actually doing nuclear explosions. So in part of that, there is uh, the multiple sensor arrays across the world. And one of the ones is infrasound. So these little red dots that you show uh, nicely highlighted on the screen, these are where some of the uh, infrasound uh, microphones are located. And Milton, my advisor, uh, is in charge of the one in Hawaii and then also one in Macau. So we look at that. And as well. yeah. we, the viewers may have heard, I mean, this is the sort of thing, presumably, that's monitoring potential tests in North Korea. Um, you don't have to go to North Korea because the, the sound waves that uh, an explosion test would generate, as we've seen with uh, the volcanic eruption, would go all the way around the planet. So you can actually do quite a lot of monitoring. And again, it's the triangulation part. Yes, so it is the triangulation part. It's also um, different explosion yields. So the size of explosions cause different signature um, mm -hmm. of the, the waveform. So we could look at the frequencies of the cause signal and then determine how large of an explosion uh, they were uh, testing. Okay. And I, I was surprised in, in slide seven, I'm not sure if this is showing a, a, a cartoon or an actual facility. In, uh, so this is, is an is actual, this, yeah, facility. This is an actual, actual array, huh? Yeah, I was confused when I first looked at this too. Um, this is actually just one microphone uh, that's hosted in the middle and all these round things around are uh, supposed to dampen the local effect. So not so much wind noise or the surrounding information, like a lot of the noises would be canceled out by these little air tubes that come into. Okay. And as a good scientist, there's no scale bar on this. Is that like <laughs> an yeah, inch it's, across or a mile across or what is it? It's a, it's a pretty big uh, field. So like, yeah, there's a door to go in, um, like a hatch. So it's a, it's a nice... Um, it's a nice so that little blank dot on the left side is a door. For, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're running out of a bit of time, Kay. So let's move on yep. to slide nine, because I think uh, the group at UH Manoa is developing some innovative things. Yes. Um, we've got an explosion and we've got 
what looks like an iPhone to me. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, I think it's a, a Samsung uh, Galaxy okay. S20, I think. Um, but yes, uh, any smartphone, we have an application called Redvox, that's R-E-D-V-O-X, um, which you just converts uh, your cell phone into an infrasound capturing device. Um, we have collaborations with national labs to do some explosion testing, and we have, we send them uh, our phones, like about, you know, 10 of them have them uh, sit at various locations and then we uh, collect the explosion data on these phones. So I, I could download this app and provide you guys with some useful information, right? Yes. <laughs> and we have a, also a nice website um, that uh, helps you look at the collected information as well. Yeah. And we provided that website is the .boy.edu um, as here we go. So that's their <laughs> website. If you need to download the app, be a viewer, go to that particular website. So, Kay, um, where do you see your career going uh, uh, after you've got your PhD? Um, are you going to stay in Infrasound or are you going back to a rock band? <laughs> I think I'll stay into the, the research field. Um, uh -huh. My funding comes from... Uh, the Department of Energy. Uh, we have a lot of connections with the national labs uh, and connection with this, especially the non-nuclear uh, proliferation uh, things. Uh, I'm pretty interested in keeping people not, you know, working on nuclear weapons right. <laughs> as yes. a way to right. keep uh, everything safe. Uh, so I think I'll stay in the field, uh, maybe work at a national lab or a private company or okay. academia. It, yeah. it, it, is there any potential that you could... Uh stay in Hawaii, it seems uh, you're, you're doing some really beneficial kinds of research. Um, yeah, what, what are the career opportunities here in Hawaii, do you think? Yes, um, I think, well, Milton, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, as well as being a professor, he has his own startup, which is the Red Vox. Uh, so yeah, he usually offers his students a position there. So that's also a possibility that I stay here working with my advisor. Um, and if not, uh, there's, uh, not just even with uh, explosions, but with tsunami warning things or with the volcanoes. There's a lot of applications for infrasounds that, you know, Hawaii is a good place <laughs> to record. Right. right. Yeah. Well, I, I believe you're like three years into your PhD. So writing the thesis right now. So, so good luck to you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you again for being on the show. Um, let me just remind the audience, you have been watching Science at SOST. I've been your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and uh, my guest today has been Kay Takazawa. Kay, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, uh, really interesting. Good luck with the, the thesis research as well. So thank you, everybody, for watching, and uh, please join us again next week when we'll have hopefully another exciting guest appearing on Science at SOST. Until then, goodbye for now. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.